Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Doc Tales podcast. I am Tim McPhillan, coming live from you here in the Heinrich House Museum in Stork DuPont Circle, Washington, D.C., and extremely pleased to be joined by Sue Bell, who is the founder of the very well-known uh, local charity group, Homer Trails Animal Rescue. Sue, thank you so much for stopping by today. How are you doing? Super great to be here. Love the location. Yeah, you Thrilled win a couple things already from other podcast guests I've had. You found your own parking spot. I did. You showed up early. I'm always early. Um, I love habit. it. Military family? <laughs> um, no, 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 just not at all. Just, just, good, just good parenting. <laughs> Um, so yes, you, 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 I really appreciate that. So we can kind of uh, prepare well here. And a little background on Sue for for those of you who don't know, she started this charity group all on her own way back in 2001, kind of by accident, um, but not really by accident. And since then, has raised or has rescued over 30,000 stray dogs and cats, among other animals, roughly. $2 million each and every year almost in donations and charity revenue. Over 40,000 right now Facebook likes, 10,000 Instagram followers, uh, thousands of volunteers over the years, plus a full-time staff um, at the, their Fairfax Station Virginia Shelter. And this is all pretty much on her own. So uh, without further ado, Sue Bell. Uh, <laughs> thank so you. Thank you so much for your time and all you've done for the community over the years. Um, like I said, you're a bit of, bit of a local celebrity. And also want to thank you for warmly inviting me to join you know, the board of directors towards the end of last year to, to do my small part to, uh, no to small part in any way possible. We're thrilled. Um, no, it really, it really means a lot <laughs> to me, and I'm, I'm excited about you know the even further growth of, of your great organization here. Um, and the reason I thought it'd be perfect to have you on is a lot of the listeners for, for this podcast are doctors, particularly veterinarians, um, that want to know what what is it really like to run a successful nonprofit rescue shelter how does how do you get the doctors involved where do you go where do you travel and how do you get it going to where it is today where it's where, where it's done all that so we're gonna get into all that um but before we before we go there uh just a couple of background questions i know um like me you were actually born in ohio stayed for a short stint and then you grew up in uh nice windy chicago where, yeah. where, where your other naperville two, yep other two Suburbs. siblings still are um and tell me where where did your passion for you know animals and helping animals come from uh, yeah, I must have come from my parents. I just I remember being a, a young kid and having the family dog and being obsessed with the dog and uh, always thinking I was going to be a veterinarian. That's what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't particularly love science, so that was not the direction <laughs> I took. Um, and yeah, I think by the time I was a teenager, I was spending all my time after school writing letters to um, to hunters and, and organizations petitioning like the clubbing of seals or hunting in general or you know, mistreatment of animals, and I, I, I was a little teenage activist in my own mind. Um, and I think I always had it in my mind that I wanted to work with animals in some mm -hmm. capacity, but I did not aspire for that to be my profession um, once I became of age to seek a profession. So it right. did kind of happen by accident. Okay, well, great. Well, it's awesome to see somebody like you able to really follow that passion. For most people, it's a pipe dream. Yeah, um, yeah. So I it's cool to you. see. And before... We'll get into the story of how it all started, but what were you doing, you know, just as a normal, you know, normal job and, and all that before you got involved starting your own charity group here? Sure. Um, I came out to Washington, D.C. as an AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer. Um, I was a street outreach worker working with homeless people, engaging them to seek supportive services and ultimately get them off the streets. Uh, and from there, I kind of stayed in that community for a number of years and then started zeroing in on uh, fundraising to help those organizations. Um, and then from working in community organizations here in DC, serving the homeless population, I moved into soccer um, by way of a, a great uh, after school program that was serving underprivileged children by teaching them soccer and poetry, uh, cool. which was very interesting. So yeah. I helped uh, kind of start that national organization in terms of bringing my, my fundraising skills to the table. Um, and then from there, I went to work for the United States Soccer Foundation, which was an $83 million Foundation, um, and I, I know that. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. So uh, I was challenged with raising more money for them, but I also had the privilege of giving it away to incubate soccer uh, for for kids in lower income areas. 
Um, and it was during my time at the United States Soccer Foundation as their development director that I founded Homer Trail. So I was doing double duty for a little while before I finally gotcha. made the leap. So before you were doing charity, you were doing five other charities. So you're putting us all to shame, so. Correct. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> it's just, I, there were great causes to work for. I also did a stint uh, working for Offender Aid and Restoration in Arlington, which serves um, some folks in jail and then helps them with successful re-entry into society after they're out. So all really good causes. Right. I felt really privileged to be working for them, and I learned a lot. So yeah. that, that helped set me up when I, I decided I to start my that. own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, and so, what was what's the story about how you know the, how it start how it all started? I know you were on a trip to, to West Virginia, yeah. right? <laughs> Who does uh, so, that? <laughs> yeah, and then all of a sudden you just started bringing dogs back home. So please tell us tell us your story. Yeah, short story is I was down with a group of probably twelve friends over New Year's Eve one year, uh, rented a cabin in Fayette County, West Virginia, on the way to the grocery store uh, one afternoon to get some groceries and probably bad beer, and drove past the building where there were a whole bunch of dogs tied up to trees, and I happened to see the sign on the building, and it said Fayette County Animal Control, and I panicked, and I thought, oh, God, I can't vacation down the road from this shelter. I'm going to freak out. I'm going to be depressed the whole time, so we stopped, and bought a bunch of dog biscuits and some things to donate. We stopped back on our way and started talking to the staff. And it was at that time they told me that the facility they were operating out of was a, a whitewater rafting, like, double-wide trailer. Uh, and they were there because their shelter had been hit by a flash flood about seven months earlier. And that uh, almost 50 animals had been trapped in the shelter and drowned. Oh, God. So that plunged me into a depression, and uh, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So we left the shelter, and I, it's all I could think about for the next three days. And I thought to myself, well... Just from one flash flood. Yes. Just from one flash flood. Yeah. The shelter was on like a 50-year flood, flood, no flood plane. No one thought it would happen, but uh, you know, it happened at night, and the waters rose and took over the shelter, and no one could get there. Um, so just a real devastating thing to hear. Um, so anyway, we stopped back in there on our way out of town, uh, on January 1, and I, I literally could not get it out of my mind, and I stared at all the dogs and the puppies, and I thought, well, what if I just take one dog home and find him a home? Um, and so we talked to the staff, and they were very excited about that, but one turned into two that turned into three, because their story was that these three dogs all came in together. So I piled them in the back of my Subaru Outback and made the drive back to the D.C. area, um, where at the time I was running a house in Arlington with my two rescue dogs, so I kind of smuggled these dogs into my house. My landlord lived across the street. Um, but by word of mouth, uh, this was before Facebook and social media, I'd put out an email telling local friends and colleagues, hey, I rescued these three dogs. I really need to find them homes. And then I decided to run a good old-fashioned ad in the Washington Post saying, you know. That's a newspaper, right? That is a newspaper. You might have uh, heard of it. Yeah. Um, ran, a, ran an ad in the, the Washington Post just saying, you know, brown dog, black dog, and sweet beagle looking for homes, call me. And my phone just blew up with people saying, oh, we're trying to, we're trying to rescue a dog, but the local shelters only have big dogs or dogs with behavioral issues. Can you help us? So I had those three dogs placed in five days, um, just by word of mouth. And then yeah. I had already placed the ad, so I kept getting calls and calls. And so I started kind of creating a list of people and what they were looking for. And then I thought, God, there's this huge supply of animals down in West Virginia, and there's this huge demand for animals here. Why don't I just put the two together? So I called the shelter and I said, I have this crazy idea. I'm the girl who was there and just took three dogs. But, you know, I've got this list of people. And, and I forgot to mention that on New Year's Day, they had told me that they were euthanizing nine out of every ten, 10 animals that they had on site because they literally had nowhere for them to go. This wasn't an area where people were coming out to adopt them. This was an area where people were surrendering them and or they were running stray. So I just, that haunted me. I just kept thinking of, you know, of the 50 animals I saw you know, most of them are now dead. So the shelter was agreeable to letting me uh, develop kind of a one-on-one -on -one partnership with them and start to, to bring dogs back. Uh, Fayette County is a five and a half hour one, one way trip. So I decided the next Saturday I would get up at four in the morning, make the drive down there, be there by 10 when they open, spend an hour, you know, kind of matching up my list with the dogs they had on site. To find the right fit for the right yeah, person. Yeah, calling the people back on the phone right. saying, I think I have this. And this is before iPhone, so there was no picture sending or anything like that. They just trusted me. And I loaded up my rental van, didn't have crates or anything, just threw them all in the van, and I drove back to D.C., and then I literally would drive around the Beltway, stopping at everybody's house. Didn't have crates? Saying, that must have been crazy. Yeah, it was crazy, but it, it just, worked. Yeah. Like, what you don't know sometimes is a benefit because right. I wouldn't do it now. So I'd drive around and say, come to my van of dogs, and these people would come out, and they'd be like, that's him, we want him. So I created 
just kind of a loosey goosey like adoption very contract. Yeah. Very organic. Um, yeah. And again, it's a blessing that I did not know then what I know now because I would have never done that. <laughs> But I kind of became obsessed, and it took over my life, and I said, you know, I'm going to rescue 50 dogs to pay it back for those 50 who drowned in the flood. And that happened within, like, the first six weeks, and I could not stop. So I started creating flyers that I'd put all over downtown D.C. and coffee shops where I worked, um, sending emails out to my friends, um, and it, it just organically kind of grew. So every other weekend, I'd wake up at 4.30 in the morning, drive down to Fayette County, bring the dogs back, and then I'd start smuggling a few into my basement at my rental house and fostering them, getting my friends to foster them. Um, hiding them in the attic, hiding them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, taking crazy. them out at night when my landlord was asleep so he couldn't see through the fence. I, I mean, it was just, it was stressful, but I, I became... It's all for the right cause. I would say you, you, I mean, it's very sad what happened to those 50, of course, but You've done 30,000, so I think you've made up for at least those 50. That's yeah, crazy. yeah. We, we couldn't stop at 50. It just kept going and going and going. That's awesome. So that's kind of the organic roots of it. But then how did it become the the entity and the organized organization that it is today? How did you get it, you know, get, get it into the actual nonprofit world and get a facility going? How did that all Yeah, just as organically. I mean, I had some nonprofit background from my jobs. So I knew a little bit about incorporating and boards of directors and fundraising. So I was lucky to have that. Um, and I, I kind of started out doing this on the side where I would Everything went on my credit card, and when I could pay back my credit card with the fees, I would. Otherwise, I would just donate the money. Um, and I did that for about a year while I was still working um, in soccer. And then finally just said, I, I got to stop. I got to do this full time. So I quit my job, and I took up random jobs on the side. I was tutoring kids. I was painting houses, um, doing some waitressing or catering, um, just so that I could help pay the rent at the time. Right. And... Um, then I was contacted by another AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer who said, my funding got cut from my position. I adopted a dog from you two months ago. Will you hire me and just pay me what AmeriCorps was paying me and I'll work for you full time? I was like, that is a bargain, absolutely. So that was my first employee um, and we kind of we kind of grew it and started working with Fayette County and little by little we started taking in volunteers who would take the animals into their homes and we started kind of uh, you know perfecting our, our systems, you know how we screened people and made sure that people were getting the right pet how to make sure they were spaying and neutering their animals, how to generate money, um, how to incorporate so that we could be a 501c3 and take in donations. Um, and then honestly, it was when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit that really took us to that next level because the attention on the animals who were afflicted by that disaster was so great. Well, it was on camera, it was all over the news. It I was everywhere yeah. and it was devastating. So many mistakes were made, um, but we were contacted by so many people asking us if we were gonna take in animals and how they could help. And so we did go to Katrina for a week and we did rescue down there and then we got back and we had 50 more people wanting to foster dogs and cats and 50 more donors that we had. So it kind of took us to that next level. Um, and, and from there, every year, we just figured out how to raise more money, how to keep our costs down, how to expand, when to grow, when to stay, when to you know, dial it back right. a little bit. Well, that time was crazy because not only dogs were getting displaced, obviously, from the hurricane, the students and people were. Everyone. I, like, I, when I was in college, we had a bunch of Tulane students at UVA that were there because they couldn't go to Tulane anymore because yeah. it was pretty much underwater. So yeah. I can't even imagine what all the animals were going. I mean, I remember seeing those videos. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of mistakes crazy. made. But um, you will find now that in times of natural disaster, so many more uh, systems and opportunities have been put in place to allow people to take their animals with them, which was a huge barrier back then. Right. Um, and so out of that horrible tragedy came kind of a nationwide standard now that people do not have to leave their animals home when they're boarding buses to get out of an area or when they're going to shelters or they're going to hotels. Animals right. are now considered more part of the family than they were then. Right. Is that Would you say that that, that happened a lot with the Houston flooding? Uh, by then, most of... The, the, the policies were in place that people could take their pets. So, yes, I think that helped a, a, a lot. Um, it's still not a perfect system, but I think it was a much easier go for those who had pets um, in terms of being able to actually evacuate with their pets versus having to make the difficult decision to leave them behind. Right, yeah. And speaking on that subject, um, and we'll get back to some of the logistics of, of running your, your nonprofit, but since we're on the subject, you were just down in Puerto Rico. Uh, I mean, I know how kind of devastating it was. And the area 
uh, of the country where Homer Trails, uh, you know, is rescuing rescuing dogs and cats, just got hit with that huge earthquake. It did. And I know you're just asking, so tell me about that whole experience and, you know, how you're able to, to bring some, some dogs back here. Yeah, so we've been operating a program down in Guanica, Puerto Rico, for going on five years now. Um, and our program consists mostly of taking in uh, street dogs and puppies, um, temporarily housing them down there, uh, getting them bedded, and then flying them over here to the States for adoption. Um, there's very little opportunity over there for adoptions. Uh, there are tens of thousands, if not millions, of stray animals in Puerto Rico just roaming the streets, roaming the countrysides, in the mountains. Um, tens of thousands are hit and killed by cars, um, injured. The, the suffering is so great. Um, and I travel a lot, but the suffering for, of animals in Puerto Rico is far worse than almost anywhere I've been. Um, so it was a bit of a shock that our little town in southwest uh, Puerto Rico, which is already one of the poorest areas of Puerto Rico, was hit by um, now over hundreds of earthquakes. They're having 30 to 50 a day. Um, they just happened to have had a pretty significant one there at the end of December, which unfortunately uh, devastated a lot of the town in terms of the buildings and the, the structures crumbling, people having to flee their homes because the ho houses were not constructed well enough to withstand the, the earthquake and then all of the aftershocks that have been going on. Um, and that has resulted in dogs just being put out on the streets when their people had to leave. Um, there aren't shelters. There are no animal shelters in our yeah, area. So there's no... We take that for granted, right? We mm -hmm. take so much for granted over right. here. Um, so when people's houses are literally crumbling and they're having to move to another town or leave the island, many of them are literally just taking their dogs out on the streets and having to let them go. Some are leaving them behind in yards and asking neighbors to take care of them, but then the neighbors have to leave and the dogs we're finding are being left in abandoned homes. Um, some are being tied up and that again, a great deal of them are on the streets. So all of our trips to Puerto Rico are incredibly overwhelming and stressful um, because of the sheer number of, of priority animals that need our help. This time, it was exacerbated by also seeing so many of the people homeless, sleeping on the streets, sleeping in tents, sleeping on the baseball fields. Um, so there was that extra added, uh, just visible suffering going on by the animals and the people. Right, right. And um, I was coincidentally at Homer Trails last week, and I actually saw some of the dogs you guys brought in. Oh, great. Because um, I was doing the, the Tails Out program. Oh, thing. yeah, great. Uh, lady, little dog, little Fantastic. dog lady. Fantastic. Uh, she was awesome. Um, so but yeah, great. I saw some of the dogs that were coming in. You guys brought back, what, 37 or so from Puerto Rico, at, at least for that one day. For that one day. Mm -hmm. um, tomorrow, we, we literally have animals who should be landing down in Miami any moment now, making the trip up here, and that will bring to the number uh, 100 dogs that we have uh, now rescued off the streets of Puerto Rico since the earthquake hit in December. Wow. That's great. Yeah, dogs and puppies. And so when so they fly into Miami and then do they do they fly to this area or do they take a ticket band or something like that? There's three ways. Work? Three ways that we get get animals over here from uh, Puerto Rico. Most of the time they're being uh, booked on uh, the commercial airlines as cargo. So we'll be able to, you know, check in five dogs on American Airlines for example and they'll fly right to the DC area. Uh, the second way, and this has been wildly popular lately and we're thrilled, is let's say you're vacationing over in Puerto Rico um, and you want to fly back and be a flight volunteer. Uh, that's awesome. You just make a pet reservation on the airline you're flying. One of our volunteers in Puerto Rico will meet you at the airport, hand you a small carrier with one dog or two puppies, uh, and those fit underneath the seat in front of you, so they fly in the cabin with you and okay. you bring them back. We've been doing that now for uh, about that's a month a really straight. That's a really cool program. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Um, and it's a great way, especially for the puppies, because a lot of the puppies are too young to travel by cargo. Um, a little so, bit less scared, too, right? If yeah, and it's so there. much fun for the people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they hang out at the airport. They become the most popular people in the airport because everybody right. wants to meet the puppies. Right. Um, and then the third way is we fly them on a cargo plane. So the plane is bringing back other goods to Miami, but they'll bring uh, uh, up to 20 crates of dogs. And so we do that probably about every six weeks because it allows us to get the most number of dogs out at one time. The plane only flies into Miami, though. So okay. they have to drive from Guanica to San Juan, sit there for five hours, fly from San Juan to Miami, and then they have to be transported by van from Miami to D.C. So it's a, chore. It's a it's lot a, of logistics, yeah. really long trip, but uh, tomorrow we will have another 37 dogs arriving, and that's on top of the 37 we had last time, on top of a few smaller 
commercial flights coming in, and then all the people who are flying back every other day with puppies and small dogs in the cabin. Wow. Okay. So when these dogs come to your your shelter, what's the first thing that they do? Do they they get some medical checkups almost immediately, or what's the process for, for doing all that? Yeah, we have a staff that does intake, and that's just to look them over, um, review their vaccine and medical history, um, administer anything that's needed at that time, additional flea and tick meds, deworming medication, check their eyes, their ears, their gums, make sure they're hydrated, um, you know, check their body scale, um, make notes on any dog that might be underweight, which is very common in Puerto Rico. Right. Um, if they're not already spayed or neutered, then we get them on the schedule that week to go be spayed or neutered because they all have to be spayed or neutered before they're put up for adoption. Option. Okay. And then they get tucked in and then they get a nice warm bed and then they're out, out in the morning making friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it's just interesting to hear that because unless you're totally like involved in the day-to-day stuff, I think most of us just have no idea how that yeah. kind of yeah. logistics work and it's kind of just as I wouldn't have known years I would ago. Have expected. Yeah, you would know that there are all those opportunities right. to fly dogs. Well, yeah. thank you for all your great work, you know, across across the U.S. and across the world. I know you've done stuff in, in Asia as well. Um, and switching gears here to a more local level, um, how have you created, cause you, you do a lot of work, not just with, you know, local, uh, rescue and international rescue, but you also do a lot of work, you know, with the legislature, with Virginia, uh, with local, you know, local authorities trying to create really good programs, uh, that'll impact not just, you know, dogs that you're rescuing right now, but things that can go forward for many years and change the entire culture of, you know, animal rescue and the way shelters do things. Um, so tell me how you've created a lot of these relationships, both politically and with other shelters, you know, to make a really big difference. Yeah, we work uh, with a, a vast network of, of shelters, um, you know, across Virginia. Um, and the way we support most of the shelters in the, the uh, more rural areas is we're taking dogs in from them. You know, they will, they will have a, a shelter that has six kennels that will fill up every single day. And they just don't have adopters in the area who are looking to adopt dogs. So we call that transfer and transport. Um, we have a system where the animals will be transported from one geographical area to another, um, where the adoption interest is low to where the adoption interest is high. And they're transferred to our program, and then we find them homes quite quickly. Whereas if they stayed in those areas, the shelter would fill up, and they would be forced to euthanize for lack of space. Right. Um, we also provide a lot of supplies, uh, whether it be food or leashes, collars, crates, you name it, to those to those areas who don't have them, um, so that their their small budgets are not taxed with things that we can actually donate. Um, in terms of the legislative issues, um, that is a huge passion of mine. I don't get to do as much of it as I'd like, but um, I've done a lot of work locally, um, Arlington County, uh, Fairfax City, mostly bringing to the county boards or the city councils uh, pieces of legislation that will make lives better for animals. Um, one of the first ones I worked on was in Arlington County um, on tethering, and tethering is simply chaining an animal. And uh, five, six years ago, you could chain your dog outside in, in your backyard in Arlington for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and that's not acceptable. That's a shame. Right. So we worked with the county board. Um, and got constituents involved to say, listen, we want a common sense tethering policy. So dogs now in Arlington County cannot be chained for more than three hours a day, um, which is life changing for those dogs that were chained their entire life. I thought you were going to say if you, if you chain your dog for 24 hours, then you have to chain yourself for 24 hours. So. Oh, that <laughs> I don't want to get you started. Maybe but. someday we'll get something like that back. <laughs> well, so we, and we did the same thing in Fairfax. Um, Fairfax did a one hour tethering uh, ordinance. So that was exciting. Uh, and then recently. One hour maximum per 24 hours. One hour maximum. Right? Yep. Okay. Um, and then a few years ago, uh, I'd gotten word that there was some guy in Arlington who had some monkeys in his basement and he was seen out walking them at night. So I went to the Arlington County Board and worked with Arlington County Animal Control, who was fantastic and said, listen, we need a common sense exotic animal bill. Like you can't. You, you can't be having tigers and, and monkeys um, and, and, you know, boa constrictors owned in, in Arlington. Right. Um, those animals should never be kept in captivity um, unless it is for a very specific reason and they truly have the ability to thrive. And that's, that's not happening in a, in a residential home. So thankfully, um, and I can't remember all the specifics, but we got a very uh, solid, common sense, exotic animal bill passed in Arlington. And then one of the most exciting pieces we just worked on in Fairfax City. Uh, Fairfax City, unfortunately, was home to uh, a pet store called Petland. And Petland is a national chain, and they are notorious for sourcing their puppies from puppy mills. And puppy mills are large-scale breeders of puppies um, 
that are, are very well known for the inhumane conditions, uh, including the overbreeding of females, dogs kept in cages, um, and then they're trucked across the country um, in very stressful conditions to land at these pet stores where they're sold for thousands of dollars. Many of them are ill at the time they're sold. Uh, many of them have genetic issues. Um, and and the, the, the consumers that are purchasing these puppies just don't know that. So there's been efforts over the years in Virginia to curb the importing of puppies for sale from puppy mills. And it's, it's made a dent, but we're still not there. So Petland, thankfully, um, closed in Fairfax City uh, because the Humane Society of the United States had done an, uh, an undercover investigation. Oh, And really? found um, some, some pretty ongoing abuses of animals going on and was able to um, bring that investigation to light. Uh, and then the, the, the franchise, the local franchise permit for that store was yanked, so that closed. So we took the opportunity to go into the city council in Fairfax City and say, you've got to stop. We have to put some things in place so that another bad pet store can't come in and operate. Um, not to get too much in the weeds here about Virginia law, but Virginia law is a, is a Dillon rule state, which means that the localities can only do what the state level allows them to do. So we had to get a little creative in terms of this pet store ordinance, because right now you are not allowed to ban pet stores that sell animals in Virginia. So we said, okay, we're gonna put in place some very stringent permitting requirements that if you want a permit to operate a pet store, you have to meet a whole bunch of criteria that includes you know, weekly veterinarian inspections, um, unannounced inspections by animal control. You have to list exactly where your puppies came from. And if they, those breeders had USDA violations, you have to list what the violation was and where it came from so that any animal lover walking into your store and interested in purchasing a puppy will see that you are sourcing your puppies from an inhumane spot. Um, so I'm thrilled that that was passed uh, unanimously um, at the very end of last year and just went into effect the first week of January. What is your kind of next goal here with, with legislation and with stopping some of these highly questionable you know, behaviors of these, these puppy mills that sound like to me they're just trying to make a profit and even if that means selling, it, selling a puppy that's not necessarily vaccinated, that doesn't have the right medical treatment, that's not getting watched by a veterinarian. So what, what's next on your horizon that you're hoping to accomplish there with legislation? The General Assembly right now is in session down in Richmond, um, and there are a number of animal bills um, addressing everything from pet stores, so asking the state to give local jurisdictions the ability to put in place ordinances like the one we just placed, uh, uh, we just passed in Fairfax City, giving the local jurisdictions more right to, to prevent pet stores from doing bad business. Business. Um, there's some bills looking at various animal shelters in Virginia and their euthanasia rates um, and requiring more of them so that animals entering the shelters have a greater chance at, at leaving alive. Uh, there's some bills talking about trap neuter release, which is a practice used to address the, uh, the outdoor cat, uh, community cat population. Um, so, uh, you know, in a best case scenario, we would get a lot of these bills passed over the next two years at the state level. Um, so that we don't have to keep going from local jurisdiction to local jurisdiction to local jurisdiction. If it's passed at the state level, then all the local jurisdictions have to abide by the state rule. That's a much uh, grander hill to, to, to scale, but um, we're, we're down there working on that right now. Awesome. Well, keep up the good work. And, you know, go and you know, l listen to your stories and everything. It's, I guess I'm imagining one of the hardest things for you is to kind of stay focused and keep a level head because this is very emotional. You know, all the stuff that you see when you're trying to go into Puerto Rico and elsewhere, these shelters, what you experienced when you started watch, you know, hearing about the, the dogs that drown and then dealing with the craziness of all this legislation. So how do you kind of wake up every morning, stay focused? You know, how, how do we help as many animals as possible not to get... Of course, you're a human being. You're going to get emotional about this stuff. That's what drives you. But how do you make sure you're able to stay focused and maintain your, you know, a level head as the leader of the organization for your staff or you know, board of directors for, and for all the, you know, the, the volunteers and everybody involved. How do you do that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, and some days I do it better than others. I think we all do. Um, right now I'm in a particularly stressful period of time because what's going on in Puerto Rico is very intense. Um, and once you go and you see what's going on, you can't turn it off. Um, I think what keeps us all going is the accomplishments. Um, you know, every animal that, that we save and is able to get into a good home, that's, that's a day well spent. Um, so we, we get knocked back. Um, we get really frustrated down in the General Assembly when people come out to oppose our bills, um, same, same locally. Um, 
we can't save every animal, but we do try, and we literally just try to focus on what we're accomplishing, not what we're not accomplishing. Um, and that same breath, I tend to focus a lot on what I'm not accomplishing, and that actually drives me. I am always looking at what more we can do, how our organization can be more effective, not just today for that one animal, but like you said, in the future. Um, my goal at Homer Trails is to be out of business. I, I would, I would love to be out of business in, in two years because we're not needed, because animals aren't entering the shelters, um, that we have laws in place to stop overbreeding, that we have uh, you know, systems in place to prevent animals from having to, to, to go to shelters. And therefore, I, we wouldn't be needed. And I could just wake right. up every day and go Makes make sense. bagels, which I would love to do, Right. <laughs> even though I'm not a morning person. Gotcha. Well, I'll give you three years to do it. Then I'll, okay. Then I'll, then I'll join you on your bagel venture as well. Fantastic. Um, and yeah, I mentioned the the program you guys are doing called you know the Tails Out program, where you can do fostering or you can watch the dog for for a couple of days and try to get him assimilated to a loving home, and then families can see, hey, is this dog going to be a good fit for me and my boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, children, Cat. or maybe just me or whatever. Um, so tell me about those programs. When did you get those started and how, how effective have they been so far? Tails Out is great. Um, and it's, it's mostly focused on the dogs that are, uh, are staying in our adoption center out in Fairfax Station. Um, and, you know, we'd like to get every dog into our shelter and out within a couple of weeks because our goal is just to house them temporarily. But... Uh, a number of times we'll bring in dogs that we thought were going to do really well with people or and with other dogs in our particular structure, and it turns out they don't um, for many reasons. And so they will be with us for quite a bit longer than we want them to be. And so the Tails Out program is to bring enrichment to their lives so that they're not spending every day, every hour in our adoption center. Um, they're getting out and getting to go on a hike. Some are just getting to go on a car ride. Some get to go and spend the night with a family. Some get to go spend the afternoon hanging out on the mall. And it's to give them a break, but like you said, it's also for us to get more information about how that dog will do in a certain environment so that we can then market the dog and be more, uh, be able to provide more accurate information about who that dog is perfect for. So the Tails Out program has been wildly successful. Um, and we love the pictures we get back from the volunteers and the dogs out hiking. And right, free social media publicity it's too. It's awesome, yeah. yeah. Um, and then people get really excited because they think, oh, that dog was out on a hike and I'm a big hiker and they'll come to see the dog. Whereas before, that would have never been a connection we made, hiking, because no one has been taking the dogs out for hikes. Right. So yeah, it's a great program. Yeah, it really is. And you mentioned, you know, there's a variety of reasons why some of these dogs struggle to get to get adopted. But what would you say the top couple of reasons are? Is it bad with other animals? Is it bad with kids? Or just I'm not used to being in a home? What are the, the most common issues? It is everything. We find um, dogs can be very dog selective, and that's because they, uh, you know, perhaps grew up tied to a tree their whole lives, and they only saw other animals as uh, threats. Because when you're tied to something, you have a fight or flight instinct, and when you can't run off because your chain, you develop kind of a natural uh, protective mechanism, and that is to fight. So we do get dogs in that aren't particularly good with other dogs. And in the D.C. area, it seems like everybody has a dog and is looking to add a second dog. So that makes it difficult when we have an animal that has to be an only animal. Um, some of them have trouble adjusting to the urban area around here. We work with mostly rural shelters, so things like stairs. A lot of them don't experience stairs. They don't, you know, hear buses. They don't spend any time on concrete. So they have to get used to the, the urban noises. And that can make a lot of them a bit fearful. Um, and then probably the saddest thing we see is just dogs that have been neglected. Um, not necessarily abused, but neglected. You know, kept in a backyard, kept in a basement, tied to a tree, and weren't given that socialization. And so they haven't ever had the experience of knowing a human trusting a human, loving a human. Um, maybe they'll be fed by a human, but we have to develop that trust in these dogs between themselves and humans for them to grow. And that can take weeks or months or years. I was say, that can take a long time. It can take yeah. years. And, you know, we as humans are generally pretty impatient and dogs and cats and all animals do things on their own timeline. And so it's finding that perfect person who's willing to take that animal into their home, knowing that the cat might not come out of the bed, come up, come out from underneath the bed for three months, or that dog cannot be walked anywhere but your backyard for three months, um, but allowing them the time and the patience to trust and kind of grow into their environment. Oh, okay, that's very interesting. And so tell me kind of going forward here, how do you envision uh, Homer Trails Animal Rescue growing 
and tell you know tell the listeners where they can go to to donate, to volunteer, and to to get themselves involved as well. Yeah, you can learn about us most at uh, just homewardtrails.org. Um, we're also on Facebook. Again, we do a lot more uh, real time posting on Facebook and our Instagram accounts, so you can see you know real live pictures of the Puerto Rican dogs. At, at Homeward Trails in. on Facebook at. Um, on Facebook, yeah, uh, Homer Trails well. Animal Rescue, mm-hmm. um, and you can, you know, we, we're always sharing links where you can donate to specific animals. You, we have we have any number of programs. You can become a monthly donor. Monthly donors are so valuable to us. Um, there's a reason that NPR does them. <laughs> you know, when you when you have monthly sustainers, it helps you budget out because you know you're going to get so much money every month, um, and that allows us to kind of create our budgets for the next year. Um, same with volunteering. You can find all the information, and you can volunteer in a million ways. You can become a foster parent for a cat or a dog. You can come and do a tails out uh, with the dog. You, if you like to drive, we, uh, we, we're sending our van down to the middle of Virginia every week to pick up animals and bring them back. We need volunteers to run our animals to and from the veterinarians. We always need supplies transported. We might need you to go to a pet store and pick up 500 pounds of cat litter or dog food that they collected and had donated for us. Um, We're always looking for people to bring their skills. Um, If you are a fundraiser or if you're a social media influencer, if you're an accountant, if you're uh, any, almost any skill we'll, we'll take and we'll find a way to plug it into our organization. Um, that, and that just helps further support our staff and our, and our volunteers. Yeah. I love the website. Cause you, there's, I mean, whatever option you're looking to get involved with, you can find it pretty much right on there and there's a good contact to find out. And people are very responsive with it. Um, and just one last thing I wanted to ask, and then we'll ask you a kind of a, a fun question before we wrap up here is, you know, what advice, and I know, uh, I know it could be a real challenge doing what you do every day to manage this, but what advice would you give to another young, ambitious person like yourself that wants to make a difference, whatever the charity is? It could be helping animals. You mentioned helping the homeless, doing those soccer programs. You've been involved in lots of things, and I know even if you did somehow make it so that this went out of business in two years, guess what would happen in two years? I know. I get sucked You'd find another. Else. You'd find I another know. thing. Then you'd want to put... You know, <laughs> you want to make sure that you know, you're being out of business when there's no more homeless people left on the streets, right? So keep up, keep up the good work. But what advice would you give to somebody how to how to do something like this and start a nonprofit that has gotten to the point where it is, where it's making a big impact? Um, just just really done, you know, mostly just on your own. What advice would you give them besides? Besides, don't do it. You're, you're crazy. Yeah, well, that, would, that might come first. No, um, I, you know, and I'll, honestly, I say I, I'm I'm like anybody else out there. I I feel so lucky that I had this passion and I was able to figure out a way to make it a career and a business and to save the lives. So, if you truly feel passionate about something and you love it and you really want to spend your time doing it, there is a way to do it. Um, and, and I'm if I I say to everybody, if I can do it. Anybody could do it. Uh, But the first thing I would do is find out what other organizations or people are doing what you want to do. And perhaps you'll find that no one is doing it. The question is, why is no one doing it? Has it been tried and it can't be done? Has it never been tried? Has it been tried this way, but you want to do it that way? Um, the, the, The biggest frustration in the nonprofit sector is a lot of people do like to follow their passions and they just create a nonprofit. And then you find that the resources are spread very thin because a lot of times you just need two groups doing something and you have 20. And 20 groups are fighting for the resources, they're fighting for the volunteers. And a lot of times it's a good idea to to assimilate yourself with an already existed organization um, and find out what they're doing well and what they're not doing well. And perhaps then you find that there is an avenue for you to start an organization to do something that's not being done. But the replication and the duplication of services is not serving uh, the, the community well. Um, so do your research um, and always have a plan. You know, make sure that if you're going to take animals in, you have a plan for getting them out. Because if you don't, you're just going to get stuck with 100 animals and you're going to end up being an animal hoarder. Um, if you're going to build relationships with businesses, make sure you treat those businesses the way you would want to be treated. Pay your bills. Just because you're a nonprofit, you don't get a get out of jail free pass. You have to pay your bills like everybody else because those businesses have bills to pay. And I will say that's one thing I'm proudest of. When we started this organization, every dog or cat that went to the vet, I paid the bill at the exact time that service was rendered. And that resulted in us building trust in dozens of veterinarians and boarding facilities and transport facilities um, around the region because they know that we are going to pay our bills. Um, Nonprofits are businesses, so you have to run it like a business. You have to have revenue. You have to have expenses. 
you can generate a profit. That profit just needs to go right back into your activities. But treat your nonprofit like a business, and you will be around perhaps forever. If you don't, you will run into the ground very quickly, and that is a common mistake that a lot of nonprofit right, people make. Right, don't treat it just like a, a side hobby. It's it's a real full time gig if you want to make a real big impact. And I can tell that you have in, in this area because everybody knows the name. And even the Washington Capitol sponsored you as their main yeah, charity. So, so I'm yeah. gonna throw that in there here because if anybody's listening, Google the Washington Capitol's canine calendar. You can't even buy one of the calendars because they always sell out. Uh, but the, the pictures are unbelievably cute. They're amazing. And it's a great way to promote They're amazing. Uh, p- promote your charity. And I was looking at the numbers earlier. It's been over half a million dollars yeah. just from the CAPS calendar, just from the Caps calendar. that they raised. And that, that number so lucky keeps to have growing. Them. So I know that the sky is the limit uh, for your amazing charity group. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm thrilled to be able to try to help as little, uh, as many little ways as possible. I'm excited to see the trajectory of this because, again, you've gotten it to where it is right now just with incredible amount of, of passion and hard work. And uh, wrapping up here on a little bit of the lighter side of things, mm-hmm. this will be news to me. Okay. Uh, cause when, Maybe when, news to me too. Um, <laughs> I've, well, I learned that you're into soccer, so that answered one of my questions. But what is, what is one fact that we should know about you that maybe like a hidden talent or an unusual hobby or something that, you know, would be a little, it's putting you on the spot a little bit, a little bit unexpected. <laughs> Oh, God. Um, Can you do that thing where you whistle, like, really loud? No, (laughs) I can't do that. I can barely whistle at all. Um, This is a terrible question. I don't know. I mean, I love to travel. I travel all over the world. That's my my favorite thing to do. Um, But that's not a a hidden... You're good at Minecraft. Yeah, You know what I'm really good at? (laughs) Really good at is that game Whack-A-Mole. Yeah. Which uh-huh. not everybody knows it is, but and it's kind of mean, but it's these little holes where these little gopher heads pop Every, up. Everybody knows what whack a mole oh, is. Okay. And yeah. you club them over the head. So I, the lady that runs an animal charity group likes whack a mole. I am awesome at that. Okay. And I actually broke the record at some little <laughs> arcade down in the Outer Banks of North Carolina 15 years ago and had my name up there. And it was one of my proudest accomplishments, but oh. I, I am awesome at whack a mole. Okay, so I found out your second greatest accomplishment. Second Whack-a-mole. greatest accomplishment. Well, it's, it, usually you're picking the animals, uh, not not hurting them. Not so hurting. that's your way of, of, of venting. Only in whack a mole am I whacking them over the gotcha. head. Gotcha. Yeah, I'll do that in real life. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's that's a hilarious answer. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Sue. Uh, again, it's uh, it's Sue Bell, founder of Homeward Trails Animal Rescue. Go check out her website. Go donate. Go get involved. You can do it across across the country, not just here locally. Um, and uh, next year, you know, make sure you get that CAPS calendar before they yes. sell out. Um, they go on sale right around Thanksgiving, and they're sold out by the second week in December. Yeah, they've got great commercials on TV, too. It's, it's fantastic. So, anyways, amazing what you've already been able to accomplish, and uh, very excited to see what's ahead. Thanks again, Sue. Your time is uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you.